Before we finish with section 1.3, uh, we're going to look at a couple of limits involving trig functions. Um, so the idea here is we want to make use of this limit that we've established. Right? So this, this is a key limit for a lot of problems that we will encounter. So this limit as x approaches 0, sine x over x, is equal to 1. Okay, So we come over here and we see something that looks very similar. The only difference between the two is there's this 2 inside the sine function. Now, um, a lot of people are tempted to just bring the 2 outside, but the sine function doesn't work like that, right? The sine function does not have that property that you can move constants in and out. Uh, the sine function is much more complicated than that, right? Um, Otherwise, otherwise, you know, if you knew the value of sine at, say, 1, you would just have to multiply by x to get to the value of sine anywhere else, and that would mean that sine is linear. It's certainly not linear. Um, so we can't simply pull out the 2, as much as you might like to. And some people will be frustrated with this because it gives you the right answer, okay? It gives you the right answer, but for wrong reasons, and you're not going to get marks for, for stumbling on the correct answer, even though your reasoning was not valid. So there, there are two ways that you could, you could do this. So one way you can do it is you could use an identity. You could say that the limit as x goes to 0, sine 2x over x, is the limit as x goes to 0 of 2. So it's not just 2 sine x, right? This is this double angle formula for sine. It's 2 sine x cos x over x, okay? And, and now you can use product and constant rules to rewrite this as 2 times the limit as x goes to 0 sine x over x times the limit as x goes to 0 of cos x. And we know that this limit is 1 from there. And we also established that you know, we can do trig functions by direct substitution. So this is just cos of 0, which is also 1. So it's 2 times 1 times 1. So we get that answer of 2. Um, the other way you can do it, and let me just put it down here. Okay, The other way you can do it is, is with a little trick, okay? And this, this, this works well for sine 2x, but maybe you're doing like sine 11x or something like that, right? Uh, there's going to be a point where you don't want to use identities to simplify because they just get uglier and uglier and uglier. Um, so what you can do instead is you can say that, well, I can't, you know, I, I can't bring that 2 out, right? But I could put a 2 on the bottom. The key thing here is that these have to match. So this is sort of the important thing, is that these have to match, right? So what it's really telling you is that sine x and x, they, as, as x approaches 0, they're both, you know, they're both approaching 0. And they're approaching 0 at sort of the same rate. They're moving along at pretty much the same pace. Um, Putting the 2 in there makes sine x approach 0 twice as fast. So what you can do is you can compensate by making the denominator approach twice as fast as well. And so you can say that this is the limit as x goes to 0 of sine 2x. So now we put a 2x on the bottom because we want to match the 2x that's inside the sine function, right? That's stuck inside the sine function. We can't bring it out. But that x is by itself. I can put a 2 there as long as I put a 2 in the numerator to compensate, right? Because those 2's cancel will get me back to where I started, right? And then I can say that's 2 times the limit, x going to 0, sine 2x over 2x. And I can argue that this limit is 1 along the same grounds as what I used to establish that original limit, right? So as long as these numbers match, this is always going to give you 1, right? As long as what's in the denominator 
matches the argument of the sine function, and as long as both of them are going to zero, you're fine. The answer is one, so we get two times one. We get that limit of two, okay? Either approach is okay. Um, this one is a little bit simpler once you get the hang of it, and, and it extends better to other scenarios where, where this is gonna become a huge mess. Okay, how about this one here? This is actually, it's a tricky limit. If you try to do it by direct substitution, you are gonna get zero over zero, right? Cos of zero is one, one minus one is zero, x is going to zero, so it's a zero over zero limit. What do we do with it? Well, we don't kinda of know anything about cos x over x, right? We certainly can't split it up, one over x minus cos x over x, neither of those limits is gonna exist, right? So we can't look at things separately, we gotta consider this as a group. And we kind of have to also keep in mind that this is the one sort of limit that we really know as x goes to zero where we have trig functions involved. And so one of the things we might say is, okay, can we turn this into a limit involving sine? Can we get from cosine to sine? Well, let's see. We know, we know that sine squared x plus cos squared x, we know that that's equal to one. Right? So, so we know that we know that sine squared x is, is 1 minus cos squared x. Now we don't have cos squared there, we have 1 minus cos. We don't have 1 minus cos squared. But this is a difference of squares. We can factor out that 1 minus cos. Okay. So now what we can do is we can look at this and we can say, all right, um, I have half of what I need. I have the one minus cos. I don't have the one plus cos. So why don't I put it in? Well, I can't just put it in the numerator. That would change the function. But if I also put it in the denominator, then I'm multiplying by one, so I haven't changed anything. All right, so now what I have is the limit x going to zero. So this one minus cos x times one plus cos x, we just saw that that's sine squared x. And on the bottom we have x times one plus cos x, okay? Now I'm gonna break this up into two pieces. Sine squared is sine x times sine x. So I can write this as the limit x goes to zero sine x over x times, and I'm gonna use the product rule for limits, limit as x goes to zero, sine x over one plus cos x, right? So if I, if I combine that into a single limit, I multiply things together, I, I'm back to here. So these are equal. And now we're in business because we know that that limit is one. And this limit can be done by direct substitution, right? Using the quotient rule for limits, right? It's the limit of the top over the limit of the bottom because that bottom is not going to zero. The top is zero, but on the bottom, cos of zero is one. So zero over one plus one. Zero over two is zero. One times zero, still zero, right? Um, so this one, we had to be a little bit more clever in our manipulations to get to the answer, but nonetheless, we have it. Um, this is also going to be an important limit moving forward when we look at derivatives of trig functions.